that, that from John chapter 6 to John chapter 7, there's a little gap of about six months. Um, what he doesn't record is a lot of the miracles that we'll see, that we have seen in Mark and in uh, Matthew and in Luke. But what's coming up now is another festival. Remember before how John is saying that during the feast, and he seems to kind of highlight the holy days of the, of the uh, Jewish calendar and the things that Christ did among those days. And it's important to keep in mind because those were all those types. Remember what we talked about, how all the Old Testament, everything was a type, a shadowing of what Christ did. So once again, we're going to see that and we're going to see that there's another festival coming up. And during this festival, we're going to be uh, introduced in John to some of the relatives of Jesus. Relatives? Yeah. Brothers. People forget about that. And then we'll discuss that and see what that's all about. And watch the, re the reaction that the brothers have. Imagine having Jesus as your older brother. All right? All right. Keep that in mind. All right? So there's a lot of little things in that we'll see in this as we go through the, uh, the reading of it and then we get into the study. So uh, without any delay, let's go ahead and get the reading in uh, John chapter 7. Chapter 7. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence, and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, shew thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up unto this feast. I go not yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him, for some said, He is a good man. Others said, Nay, but he deceiveth the people. Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? But Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God, or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law. Why go ye about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil, who goeth about to kill thee? Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me, because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Howbeit we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. He shall seek me, and shall not find me. And where I am, 
thither ye cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go, that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles, and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this, that he said, Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come? In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him, and some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Then answered them the Pharisees, are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, Do thou, Lord, judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Every man went up to his own house. All right, so that's chapter seven. All right, so let's just take a look at this. Let's see what we can find in this thing here. I think it's interesting to see uh, a couple of things. First of all, it starts off once again with that phrase, after these things. So John is letting you know that there was a, a period of time that, have, that has gone by. All right, so after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee for he would not walk in Jewry or in the, the uh, J Jerusalem area because the Jews sought to what? Kill him. Now, what was the main reason why they wanted to kill him? Do you remember? What, what did he do? He was healing people on the Sabbath. Remember the man that was by the pool? That was the, real, that was the main thing that got his goat, that got the Jewish people's, the, the Jewish leader's goat. They were like, listen, we done already set up and establish how things are supposed to be. We've interpreted to the community how the laws are supposed to be obeyed. And when we tell you how the laws are supposed to be obeyed, that's just it. Remember, they had that philosophy that because they were the leaders and they were telling the people that since I am the leaders, God puts us in the leadership and God then says, obey them that what? Have rule over you. When we tell you to do something, you're supposed to do it. And it's the law. All right, so they, they're, once again, they're taking a bunch of scriptures, putting them together, creating a philosophy, and then using that to, to convince the people that you have to do what I say do, or you're going to be, you know, condemned. And right now, they're at a point because Jesus is saying, you've totally misunderstood it. And as we get into this, we're going to see, he's going to tell them why they are coming up with wrong judgment, why they're reading scripture and coming out with the wrong answer. All right, and that's uh, it's, it's unfortunate, and what's sad about it is it just doesn't still doesn't just happen back then. It happens today. There is no one that can that can 100% know all, because we don't know all. We have to wait for God to do what, reveal it to us. So for someone to say that they know everything that there is to know uh, is an error. You can't know it. You need to lean on God and ask God to give you what wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And that's, that's uh, all you can do. But what you do is you follow his word. You go through his word, and his word will help and guide. So they're looking to kill him, right? Verse 2. It says, now uh, the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. Okay, now the Feast of Tabernacles was one of the most important feasts. You basically had the Passover, you had Pentecost, and the Tabernacle. Those were the three feasts which all the Jewish men were required to go to. Now keep that in mind. They were required according to the... The, uh, the, the uh, Old Testament law required to go to that. Now, also, the Feast of Tabernacles, what did they celebrate? Real, in brief, it basically celebrated the Jewish 
commemoration of them going 40 years in the wilderness. All right. And so what they would kind of do is they would kind of camp out. They would go out to the to the, uh, the, the the cities or sometimes in their, sometimes even in their own yards or whatever their, their own towns, and they would cut down branches and build little huts and and, le and live out outdoors. It was a. Yeah. That just happened a couple weeks ago, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, cuz it's a fall, it's a fall festival. And they they build these these little huts and they live outside for a period of time and they have food and it's enjoyment and the kids, you know, were supposed to look up in the in the sky through the 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 cracks in the huts and see the stars and say, "Well, these are the same stars that our forefathers looked at when they were in the wilderness when they were going through from Egypt to the promised land." And then in the last day, there was this immense pouring out of water in the temple. Uh, and this is where, you know, they, they kind of uh, commemorated that the fact that while they were in the wilderness, Moses was able to strike the rock. And what came out of the rock? So that was what they were celebrating, all right? And similar to any other kind of nation that has a, 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 a holiday, they're celebrating something that happened in the past, all right? America has, what, 4th of July. That's our national holiday of, of what? Celebrating our independence. So, all right, so you can see that it's just a holiday uh, festival, but it's also a mosaic law, and it's important, and it also is very symbolic to the work of Christ. That's one difference between these festivals. These festivals all point to the Messiah, and we're going to see that in just a bit. All right, look at verse 3. It says, and his brothers, therefore, whose brothers? His brothers. His brothers. Who's his? Jesus. And his brothers, therefore, said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, uh, that thy disciples also may see thy works uh, that thou doest. All right, now look at this. Look at verse 4. For there is no man that doeth any uh, thing in secret and himself seeketh to be known openly. Here it is. If thou do these things, Show thyself to the world. Does that sound familiar? If thou do these things, if thou be the Christ, command these stones. If thou be the Christ, cast thyself down. Who said that to him? Another temptation. Remember the scripture said that Satan left him for what? A season. But he didn't come to him in a form that was like he did at the temptation in the wilderness. But he came in all kinds of other forms. To not believe that the devil uses people and close people. Sometimes that does happen, unfortunately. But we've all been um, pawns. You know why? But we, we, that's right. You know why? Because we are imperfect. And as innocent and as, and as caring and as... Um, well-meaning as we try to be, we all can be a thorn to somebody. All right? And so you got to keep that in mind. We all have thorns, and we all have been thorns. That's part of it. And right now, Jesus is dealing with his brothers, and his brothers are being a thorn to his side. But Jesus gets right on their case. Look at what he says. Um, in verse 6, it says, Then Jesus answered and said unto them, My time is not yet. But your time is always uh, ready. So he's basically saying, for me to go up to this festival for fulfillment of what I have to do is not yet. I don't need to go up now. He said, but you need to go now. He said, your time is, is ready now. You, your time is always ready. They didn't believe in him at this time. Now, who, do, who are Jesus' brothers that we do know of? James. And who else? Jude. All right, and we know that there was there's one more which they they say that his name is uh, Simon could be Simon, and it's a possibility that he had sisters. There's no way we I can actually prove that to you, but there's some, you know, there's some um, uh, speculation that, that you could kind of read into a scripture that might say that he might have m more than just brothers. But um, we do know of James, and we do know of Jude, and we do know that after Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection, they do what? They believe, they believe in him. They then begin to realize that he, John Baptist was his, was his cousin. Exactly. All right? So he says, my time is not yet, but your time is always ready. So he's letting them know that you guys should be believing 
uh, now. You should be accepting me. You've been close to me. You've seen me. But the Bible says that a prophet has no honor where? In his own town, in his own country. That basically means that, you know, uh, you could be the most important person to the world. But when you come to your own town or to, when you, to your own family, who are you? You just, just who you're supposed to be. You could be the man to the world. But when you come home, you still got, your wife's going to, could you take out the garbage? Could you clean the garage? <laughs> could you do that? You know, you still got to be who you, who you are. And so, and that's a common human uh, 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 philosophy. But what happens sometimes is that it goes above what it's supposed to be, where you don't recognize because you're so used to seeing him as a common person. Now, they're going to say that again. We're actually really going to see that. We'll see it a little bit here. But when we get into the, the eighth chapter, we're going to see that uh, very clearly where they're going to be like, who is this guy? We know him. And they're going to say that here as well. But they're going to really point it out once again in the eighth chapter. All right. But um, look at verse 7. It says, the world cannot hate you. All right. But me, it hateth. Why does it hate him? Well, he answers his own question, uh, his own statement. Because I testify of it that the works thereof are what? Evil. Evil. And that's the whole point right there. The Lord Jesus is saying that, the, that basically you are in an evil system. And that system is based upon what? The fact that we all are born in what? Sin. In sin. That's basically all it is. All right? There's nothing you can do about it but uh, accept and believe on Christ and repent. That's how you take care of sin. It's as simple as that. Can you stop being a sinner? You can't. You're, 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 you're born a sinner. You're going to die a sinner. But you don't have to die in your sins. And that's where the difference is. You have to accept Jesus as your Savior. Now, one thing that we, I, I have to mention, and I always try to make this clear, the fact that because you accept Jesus as your Savior and you don't become perfect and you still have the, the opportunities a lot of times to fail and to make mistakes does not mean that you have license to make mistakes. We have to underline that. You are supposed to begin to, at some point, resemble a character and an attitude and a mindset that of the Father and that of Jesus. So it should be a, you know, they used to say back in the, back in the old days, that there's been a change, a change, a change has come over me. I remember that, that old song. And uh, that was a good song because the reality of it is, no, it doesn't make you perfect that you, that you accept Jesus as your Savior, but it should change the way you think. Your, your, your intentions, your, your motivations definitely should change. But, you know, once again, it, uh, it, it, it really depends upon have you really accepted him? If you know of him, and we're going to see that in a minute because some people are going to say, well, I, I, I believe he is the Christ. But do you, exactly. But do you believe he's your Christ? Do you believe he's your Messiah? And have you accepted him? Knowing he's the, the, the Messiah, knowing he's the Christ, doesn't change you. Accepting him as your Messiah, that I believe him and I, I believe that my sins are covered by, by his death, burial, and resurrection. That's how I'm going to heaven. Now, there's a lot of people that are going to know about Christ and not go to heaven because they don't believe and accept him as my uh, uh, Savior. You see, it's, it's like this. Let me, let me, I'm going to take a, take a moment here. I'm going to create a scenario, and hopefully I can uh, uh, put this together. But let's just say, let's create a world. We're going to call this world uh, Sin City. Okay? It's called Sin City. Now, in Sin City... Everybody that's born in Sin City is born owing a debt just for being born. You have a charge for being born. So I would create a, a number, let's say $10,000. All right, so as a baby infant, two minutes old, you already owe the, the government of Sin City how, how much money? $10,000. All right, now uh, Sin City says that Everyone that is in Sin City that owes us money is now an employee of us. And so since you were just born and everyone is an employee of us, we have to take one of our employees and have them raise you. It just so happened that your parents are the employees we're going to have raise you. So, but we charge you for using our employees to raise you. 
another $10,000 a year. So by the time you are 10 years old, how much do you owe Sin City? $100,000 plus the $10,000 that you, you have for being born. And by the time you're 20, how much do you owe? $210,000, all right? Then the, the, the city says, well, since you can't pay us back, and now that you're an adult, you gotta pay adult fees. Adult fees for Sin City is a million dollars a year. Bless you. So, and you know, nobody in Sin City can make a million dollars a year because everyone in Sin City is an employee of the government of Sin City because they've never been able to get out of debt. And so by the time you 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 reach like, you know, 30, 40, 50 years old, you owe hundreds of millions of dollars because then they start uh, tapping on interest and, and penalties and, and all these other things. And then if you do something wrong, like you get a, you know, a speeding ticket, that's another, you know, 50,000. So Sin City just, it just charges you. How can you pay the debt? How can you pay the government of Sin City? You can't pay it. The only way you can not owe Sin City is to not live in Sin City. It's the only way. And because Sin City is the whole world, there's no place you can go, the only way out of Sin City is to do what? To die. That's why the Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. Now, let's just say that somebody comes to Sin City boop, and says, I have unlimited money. I have enough money to pay for every uh, um, every uh, citizen of Sin City. And I have the, the money to pay for it, not just for your current debt or the future debt. And not just the future debt of the people that are living. I have money to pay for all the, the debt of anyone that's ever lived and enough money to pay for the debt of anyone that will live. All you got to do is just come to me and say, please pay for my Sin City debt. Now, Anyone that comes to that person and says, I want you to pay for my Sin City debt, will be made debt free. So what do you have to do? You just have to go to them and ask for it. In a very crude way, what I just did was paint a picture of what Christ did. We're born in this world of sin. And there's no way we can pay the debt. And since we cannot pay it, no matter how good you try to be, no matter how perfect you try, you're going to always come up short. You're going to always end up owing more than what you can do. Jesus is the answer. He's the one that pays our debt. Yes, sir. I agree with everything you're saying, but he also said repent and don't sin anymore. That's right. He didn't say to the woman at the well, the, whatever, the adulteress, he said go and sin no more. Not, all right, you're good. You know, keep on knocking it out the way you've been doing. Mm -hmm. right? You can't just say, like, hey, one time... Sorry, boom, man. Well, and that, that's that's the uh, that's that that enigma of did you really? Because see, the thing about it is, if you really, um, if you really are, I have to say it this way: it is. If you really are a child of God, if you really accept Christ as your Savior, I can't even find an analogy to make it. But if you really make Him your 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 Lord and Savior you will change and your attitude will be just like what Brother Gabe said. That you're not going to just, I'm going to do wrong just because I know I, I, I've, I asked Jesus for my forgiveness of sins and he forgave me. That's why that scripture, remember that scripture we read? That many people will come to, to Christ and say, Lord, Lord, have we not done all these wonderful works in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me, you worker of what? Iniquity. I know you're not. So therefore, we got to make sure that, that when we make that transformation, that we truly have been transformed. And you know that you're transformed because Jesus said, the scripture says, a tree will be known by its what? Fruit. So how do we know that you have been transformed? And that's what James points out. One more scripture that goes with this is James 1 and 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, for every man be swift to hear and slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, mm -hmm. and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. There you go. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. There's That's a lot it. of people in church exactly. that, that be like screaming and hollering, rolling on the floor. They're holy, and then they walk out, and they'll be cussing at you in the parking lot. That's right. You know, they're not doers. They're the, receiving the, the, transfer, the transformation has not truly taken place. 
And one of the things, and I, you know what, and, and I'm going to take a little deviation here. I, I know we, uh, further on, we were going to get into this, but since this came up, I'm going to do it now. What do you think the phrase means, take the Lord's name in vain means? What do you think that means? What, what have you been taught? Let's put it that way. That that means? People mean that like to say, use Jesus' name as a, as a cuss word. As a cuss word. But really, you, go ahead, you're going to explain it. All right. And most people say, when somebody says, you know, GD or stupid or whatever, you know, whatever, all those things are taking the Lord's name in vain. But in reality, that's not it. Taking the Lord's name in vain, meaning saying to people outwardly, I am a Christian or I am a follower of Jesus, but not doing what he says. That phrase, you know, uh, don't just hear my words and, and, and not do what I say. You know, why be ye hearers and not doers? That's taking the Lord's name in vain. Now, I know that is really one of the things that is highlighted. When you read in Revelations, when Jesus is talking to the seven churches, how many times does he talk about individuals that say they are Jews or say they are followers or say they are Christ-like but are not? Because they are taking the Lord's name in vain. In other words, I'm taking on that I'm a Christian, but I'm not. So I take the name on in what? In vain. I just have the name, but it doesn't change me. And that's what we have a lot of. We have a lot of people that are taking the Lord's name in vain. They say they are Christians, but are not. And therefore, they are, and, and it's, kind of, it's kind of funny, too, because we're so worried about saying the bad word. But in the Bible, you know what God and Jesus calls them people? Bastards. Now, now, a lot of times people say, well, you know, you shouldn't say that. that's a that's a bad word. Well, it's in the scripture. It's a strong word. That's right. He did. It's a strong word. But that's what is that's what is called to people that take the name of God in vain. They say they are, but they are not. They are not. They have not been regenerated by the Lord. But they walk around as though they, they are. They try to act like they do. And you're going to see that as we get further on, Jesus is going to tell the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees are going to say something like this. We have our father Abraham. And Jesus is going to say to the Pharisees that, that, that uh, Abraham and God is not your father. You are of your father, the devil. So they take on the whole. I mean, but here's religious leaders that are saying that they're following Jesus and Jesus is saying you're taking my name what in vain all right so we got to keep that in mind all right yep exactly we know that we are under the dispensation of grace. But in other terms, we don't just wear it out. We know, we know you, you just want to around cursing. We have this guy on my job now, and he's a singer and all that, and he expects me to be a Christian on the job. And now then people are hammering him because he's doing things in front of them that are not Christ-like. Mm -hmm. And now they're looking at him saying, well, you ain't no Christian, you ain't nothing. Mm -hmm. So now they're disrespecting him, and he's feeling bad about it. But, you know. Yeah, it is. It's it's a it's it's a funny thing because you do have to walk the walk. What what the understanding that you you're not perfect, but at the same time you got to walk the walk with the mindset that I'm trying to do everything I can. I'm trying to cross every T I can cross, dot every I I can dot, knowing that I'm probably gonna miss one or two here or there. All right, but you can't be doing stuff. I mean, we got a high profile name in the news now. All right, and we see what's going on with him because he was built up to be, you know, this model of, of moral excellence. All right, but what what what, what happens? We, we, you find out that no, you can't put nobody up. The only person you can put up there like that is Jesus. Right, that's it. I like to put every man in here in his shoes and see if he can do as good as he did. Exactly. Just so, got much money. I mean, I'm glad I don't have much money. Yeah, it's a, a lot of lot of temptations, a lot of situations. But the reality of it is, what happens is, if you begin to believe the, own, the, the hype that they put on you, that you this, then you that. Well, he's got it. You 
want to sponsor, so he's just mm-hmm. doing his job. That's just like it. When you're in the world, you don't walk around telling people what you think in your mind. Exactly. You exactly. Tell people about it. It's 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 a tough situation, but the reality of it is, there's only one person you can truly look, truly look up to as being perfect, and that was the uh, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one that has been able to walk on this planet and live without making a single mistake, without making an error. And at the same time, he told people the truth, and he made a lot of enemies. You see, but you don't make uh, enemies just for enemies' sake. But when you tell them the truth, and people don't want to hear it. So be it, all right? So uh, let's move along here. Let's see, where did I leave off at? I'm, I had to put that little insertion in there. All right, um, but in, and uh, I think in verse eight, he, he told his, his brother, and he said, now you go up to the feast. Uh, he says, and I, uh, I go not up yet. Now keep underlined the point yet, because he, he's not saying that he's not going up. He says he's not going up what? yet all right he says unto the feast for my time is not yet full come all right verse 9 it says and when he had said these uh words unto them he abode still in galilee but his brethren went uh went up and they went also up to the feast not openly well it says and he went also up to the feast but not openly so he went what after his brothers but now we'll we'll get an idea as to when he went. He didn't. He went kind of towards the middle of the feast. We'll see that as we go along as to when he went. He didn't go like they went and then an hour later he went. It was maybe a day or two or three that, that he waited and then he went up. All right, verse eleven. It says then the Jews sought him uh, at the feast and said, "Where is he?" All right. So that right there is the first sign that that the, the feast was going on long enough to where. The, the people, the Jewish folks were looking for him because remember, he had already built up a very popular uh, following because all of the miracles that he did, healing all these different people. And so now at this feast, they just assume, hey, here's a wonderful feast, a glad feast. This was like their Christmas almost like, you know? And 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 uh, and I'm gonna, even the fact that I threw that word in at the end, I wanna make a, a statement about, uh, about that. And I'll have something for you guys next week. But anyway, this is like their holiday, their, their, their festive holiday. And they're like, where is Jesus? They was expecting him to be there, all right? So he hasn't showed up yet, verse 12. And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him, all right? He's got a lot of conversation going on. For some said he is a good man. A lot of people say that today. Others say nay, but he deceiveth the people. A lot of people say that today, all right? But I find it interesting that... Um, you can say both of those things and still end up not making heaven. You can still end up uh, lost by saying Jesus is a good man, and you definitely will end up being lost if you say he is a deceiver. Because a lot of people think Jesus is good, but they don't think he was God. They don't think he was God coming to flesh. And that's a, uh, that's a big uh, difference. All right, verse 14. It says, uh, now about the midst of the feast. You see what it says? The what? All right. The midst of the feast, Jesus went up unto the, the temple to do what? To teach. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man uh, letter, having never what? Having never studied or never learned. Jesus did not go through the rabbinical schools. He didn't learn through their so-called uh, structured institutions. He learned by reading the scripture, the same thing that we're doing. You follow the scripture. You start at one point and you go through it. I don't think that you could say that Jesus skimmed through the word. I, I, I have to believe he read every jot, every tittle. He read everything more than once. And so this was the thing to keep in mind. Some people say, well, yeah, but he was God. But remember, he also was what? He was man. He was human. And so he came to show us how you are to do it. You're to go through it. And remember, when he taught, and this is one of the reasons why I, I call our little fellowship Emmaus, because when he walked down the Emmaus Road, he said that when he was uh, ready to teach those, those guys that he was walking with, beginning at Moses, and then going through the prophets, he taught them everything concerning himself. 
beginning at the beginning and then going to the end. And and to me, that just is clear that if Jesus is going to have a study and that's the way he studies, that's the way he's going to teach, then I think it's important for us to make sure that we don't skip over certain portions. Just because, well, I don't want to read or talk about that portion because I don't really understand it. That ain't for me to understand. If the Lord says, read it, read it. Now, what you may find is the minute that you read it, at that point, the Lord may give you illumination. And even if you don't understand it, that's a fine. Read it next year. Read it the year after. Because guess what happens? Revelation might come. Understanding might come. See? Now, not to say that this is how it's going to be, but there's a scripture that says that the whole world will see Jesus when he comes, as he comes. Now, how can that be? I don't know. But I know now there's a whole lot more possible now in my mind than how it was during the times when, say, George Washington or Napoleon was on the planet. They're thinking, how can you see what's going on in, in uh, Europe if you happen to be in Africa? Or how can you see what's going on in the United States if you happen to be in Australia? Well, we see that every day now. You know, you can go on the computer, you can go on the television, you can go on your cell phone and see anything that's going on anywhere. All right? So we see that that's one possibility. So that scripture that says that the whole world will see him, to me now, is a mute point because there's so many ways. Not even to say that the ways that we know through technology will be the means in how the whole world will see him. It could be something yet still be developed, or it may be something that God won't even show us until that actually happens. But the point I'm saying is that it's a lot more clearer to us than it may have been during, you know, the 18th century or, or earlier because they didn't have technology. But that shows you how as you keep reading the word and keep living, scripture becomes more what? Revealed, more relevant, because we're going to get closer to it. All right. So we see, and I don't know why I got off on that tangent, but <laughs> I see to be... I always, I always thought he'd be in the sky, like just like you see the moon, you'll see him coming. He's not gonna be here like two seconds. It might take like seven days. The whole world will see him in the sky. There you go. That could be it too. It might take some time to get here. That could be so it. Everybody be warning. Yeah. I don't know. It could be, and I, and I, I don't know either. All we can do is say that at that point in time, everyone's gonna say, "Oh, that's how he did it. <laughs> it's gonna happen." But. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it ain't funny, but it is. <laughs> All right. So they see him teaching in the temple. And then they, they uh, it says, and the Jews marveled, saying, how knoweth this man let us have never learned? Yeah, he didn't learn from you. That's how. Verse 16. Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. So what is he saying? He said, I'm not trying to learn for my own self. I'm trying to learn the, about the one that sent me. So he's, and which is interesting because here's someone that eternally existed with the Father, but from a human standpoint is is trying to is, is learning the Father. How? Through the Scripture, which is telling us that how can we learn about the Father? Through the what? Through the Scripture, through the Word. All right, it's important for us to to recognize that. Um, and 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 yes, it's it's an enigma. How how can he learn of the Father when he's always been with the Father. But once again, in his human form, there's a, there's a difference. And I'm not going to try to give you the math on that because I don't understand it. <laughs> Verse 17, if any man will do his will, he shall know uh, of the doctrine uh, whether it be of God. All right, so basically what Jesus is saying, if you seek to do the will of the Father, you will know whether the doctrine that's being taught or the doctrine that you hear of or the doctrine that you speak of is of God. How will you know? I don't know. You just know. How do you know what kind of ice cream you like? You just, you, but the Bible says, the, uh, the word says what? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So you got to read it. You got to read it. And, and what gets me is the people that say, I have a guy at my job. And he goes, well, I don't like reading the Bible because as many different people as read the Bible, you're going to find that many different opinions. And I said, you're absolutely right. But that should not be the reason why you don't form your own opinion. Don't follow one of these other opinions. Go through it and get your own opinion. I think that's one of the problems that we have is that you get a, a, a couple of people that happen to get a decent following and they become the so-called experts on the word well what did 
you know, Reverend Know-it-all say, well, I think it means this. And what did Reverend All Understanding say? Well, I think it said this. But in reality, you need to read it for yourself. Get a full understanding. Now, does that mean that you don't want to input? Because the Bible does say, let everything be established by what? Two or three witnesses. So I don't want to go off on a tangent and just say, well, I think it's this, and I don't care what nobody else says. No, I want to know what other people think. But I'm still going to form my what? My own opinion. And I might ask myself, well, what do you think about this? What do you, what do you, you know, and I'll get commentaries. That's why I go and I get commentaries. Because if I see that there's nobody thinking like I'm thinking, I'm just going to, well, you know. But that don't mean I'm going to change just because of that. But I am going to do double checking to make sure that I'm not off on the tangent. But it's important. You do need to have that collaboration. That's what's nice about fellowship. You don't get off on an island all by yourself. And when no one is there to, to check or correct you, you then end up in Guyana with Jim Jones. That's what happens with him. Nobody's there to check what he's got to say. No, he, Whatever he say is law, and no one can add to what he's saying or, or improve on what he's saying because he said that he was God now. Hmm? Like who? Oh, yes. Gollum. <laughs> Gollum. But it's important. You don't want to get out there all by yourself. <laughs> she tried to pull that in there. I was like, uh, okay, right. that's, a, that's a literary um, uh, major. That's why. So she's all into all those novels. All right, but look at this. All right, so he's talking about his doctrine. Look at verse 18. It says, and, and uh, he that speaketh of himself seeketh his what? Own glory. All right. So a lot of times people that form an opinion, then go into the scripture to find verses that back up their opinion. That's not the way we do it. Don't form an opinion and then try to form, get to the Bible and say, oh, this is how I can back it up. No, read the Bible and let the Bible help you to understand what the Bible is trying to say. And then you follow the Bible. Don't let the Bible, don't try to get the Bible to follow you. I want to get the Bible to agree with what I'm saying. No, you want to agree with what the Bible is saying. Because it's, if it's the word of God, you can't correct it. You can't improve upon it. All you can do is follow it. But if you go in and try to manipulate it, and that's why the scripture gives that warning. If you take away from the scripture, the Lord says, I will take away from you eternal life. And if you add to the scripture, I will add to your, to your situation the plagues. And that's important that we don't do those things. All right? So uh, he says, but he that seeketh his glory... Uh, that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did you hear that? If you're seeking to follow the word, Jesus said, if you're looking to follow the word and follow and get the glory that God has revealed, there is no unrighteousness in you. How is that possible? Is there anybody in here perfect? Well, how could there be no unrighteousness in you? But they capitalized the H, didn't they? Hmm? On the H. The first, the first H, yes. But look at the look, look, look at it again. It says, it says he, okay. he that seeketh uh, uh, of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh the glory of him that sent, uh, that, that is this the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. So you are, once again, shown that you are imputed. It is what? It's righteousness that is what? That you earned? That you what? You receive. When you seek to do his will, when you seek to follow the Lord, you are becoming a follower of the Lord, which means that you are now taking on his gift of, of righteousness. Whose righteousness do we have? Our own? Christ. We have Christ. That's the only way we can get into heaven. You can't stand in front of God and say, God, I stand in my own righteousness. What's going to happen? You're going to be judged by your own righteousness. But if you say, Lord, I stand under the righteousness of Jesus, then you're going to be entered into heaven because I, I can't bring my own righteousness. And so you are made, you are made righteous by Jesus, by his work, by his 
uh, 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 atonement. And we'll get on, get into all that, the, the full aspect of what the atonement was, that actual price that he paid to redeem man. All right, look at verse 19. It says, did not Moses give you the law? Look at this. And yet none of you what? None of you keep the law. Then he says, why go ye about kill to kill me? Now, he's pointing out to something. He's saying, there's no one here that has been able to obey the law completely. And according to that, then, you know, if you are guilty of breaking the law of Moses, and then you accuse me of breaking the law of Moses, so they say, then why do you seek to kill me when you're doing it too? All right? But look at what he said. He said, now, when he makes that statement, then a statement is made by the people, which I think is very important. We should underline verse 20. Look at what the people say. The people, that means the, the multitude, the majority of those folks out there answered and said, thou hast a what? A devil. Who goeth about to kill thee? From the people's standpoint, they didn't know what the Jewish leaders were trying to do. They didn't believe in this so-called conspiracy to kill Jesus. Y'all hear about all these, these you know, conspiracies that are going on? And the people, they weren't hearing it. There's, well, there's no conspiracy to keep evolution uh, 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 going, even though we have proof that there's not any true, sci true scientific evidence with all the new scientific evidence that is coming about, it is disproving evolution, but there's a conspiracy to keep it going because we don't have anything else to replace it. People say, man, you're crazy. Or back in the day, they didn't say you're crazy. They said, you, are, you got a devil. Because when you don't believe that there's a conspiracy, you think someone's just making up stuff. But I'll tell you, not only was there a conspiracy, the people were wrong. There was a conspiracy to kill Jesus. Who was trying to kill him? Jewish leaders, the Pharisees. And just like there are conspiracies today, there are cons conspiracies to keep evolution. That's a whole lot. I mean, I pick on evolution because that's easy to pick on. That's very obvious. But there's a lot of other ones going on too. And they all have to deal with the fact that they don't want anything that Jesus teaches to become common knowledge, truly believed upon, because it takes away their power. And it forces them to admit that the way they're living is what? Wrong. Jesus said when he talked to his brothers, why does the world hate me? Because I reveal to them it's what? It's evil. And that's what the world does want. That's why they will not, they, they have to keep the fact that, that God created the world and, and that we are responsible to God. Because that would open up the door for us to say, well, then, then a lot of ways that we have in this world is wrong and evil because you know, the Bible says if God is the one that created the world, and he's the one that gave us the Bible, the Bible says a lot of ways that we have are wrong. Well, they don't want that. They want to say, no, we can live how we want to live. Every man can live to inform their own opinions as to what's right or what's wrong. And if you think that God created you, they don't use the devil. They say you're ignorant or you're what? Or you, 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 you are a religious fanatic. See, they have other words to call you today besides just saying that you have a devil. But you got to be careful of that and don't let it discourage you from the fact that you know the truth. That, yeah, there is things going on behind the scenes that try to push out the truth of Christ and keep this lie going and keep these falsehoods going. But uh, the people said, you know, who's trying to kill you? Look at verse 21. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work. And he, once again, he's talking about that. The one thing he's fo focusing on is healing that man by the pool. And, and ye marveled. Look at verse 22. Moses therefore gave you circumcision. All right. But then he points out, and not because it is of Moses, but uh, of, the, of the fathers. Circumcision actually was given to who? Abraham. All right. But Moses, once again, put it into the uh, Mosaic law. And ye, it says, and, uh, and ye on the Sabbath day circumcised a man. Uh, if a man on the Sabbath day received circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Now, what is he saying? He's saying, now, he said, now, if y'all think about it, and we're getting ready to get to what I think is one of the most important 
verses, and, we're gonna, and we'll stop there, in, in, in the book of John. There's so many of them, and that's why I say one of them. But let's point this out before we actually go to that verse. He's saying, now, look, I healed a man on your Sabbath day. All right. But now, if a child happens to be born, and it just so happens, because the Mosaic law says on what day the circumcision is supposed to take place, on the what? Eighth day. Every male child is supposed to be what? Circumcised on the eighth day after he's born. Now, if that eighth day happens to fall on a what? A Sabbath day, you still circumcise him. That means you went to work. Jesus is pointing that out. He's saying, look, look at how your, 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 your philosophy is wrong. And what you need to understand is there's a lot of laws that are deeper and more uh, profound that you just don't understand. That's why he says the law of Moses, which is actually further back than Moses, it actually goes back to Abraham. But there's a lot of laws. There's a lot of reality. There's a lot of things that go further and deeper than what we think it does, which is why he makes this next statement, which I think you should underline, put stars around, circle it, do whatever you need to do, because this is so important. Verse 24, he says, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. That is so key. That is so key. Because what happens, Jesus is saying, you're looking at things superficially. You're looking at things just on the surface. And you never really investigate what's behind it. Now, they're going to make a statement that, 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 that no, no prophet comes out of Galilee. If they really had read their scripture and really studied, they'll find out that there is a prophet that come out of Galilee. All right? And uh, actually, for your homework, Let's see if anybody can find out who those, there's, there's two of them that I, there's actually two prophets in scripture that came out of Galilee. Even though they say, search the scripture, no prophet comes out of Galilee. So let's see if we can find out who those prophets are. All right. And uh, it's important to kind of get an idea. But the point is, Jesus is saying that there is a lot of superficial believing, a lot of superficial activity. Now, let me make one real clear one that we all know about and that we've already been able to understand the true background information, but initially people will never really notice it until it's explained to them. When you look up in the sky and you look at the sun, does it not look like the sun is what? Moving across the That's how it what? Appears, doesn't it? It does appear like the sun is moving across the sky. But not until you do deeper investigation do you begin to realize that the sun is not what? Moving, but the what? The earth, the earth is moving. And the only way you can know that is by doing some extra or deeper or more in-depth study. Now, we all know that, and since that has been discovered, there has been a whole lot of changes. But that was, in, in the whole total of human history, a somewhat recent scientific discovery, although the Bible already said in, in, in a lot of places how the, the earth actually is uh, the one that's moving. But uh, Galileo, when he tried to point it out to the, uh, uh, the Catholic Church, he was put under house arrest because the church would not go and study deeper like Galileo did. Jesus is saying right here, you're making a lot of mistakes you're judging me wrong because you're judging by appearance and not by how things actually are. And I think that's one of the problems. Like I said, that the friend I got at the job, he's looking at surf, you know, surface, superficial things, just common stuff. He's, well, I, I see this, I see that. Now, plus I see that, you know, all these folks that I see in these churches, they don't, they ain't about nothing anyway. And I go, yeah, that's, I'm not going to argue with you there. I'm not going to debate that. That's not even the issue. The issue is, what are you going to do about Jesus? That's, that's, that's the issue. Because if you don't do something about the Lord, then you're going to be lost. Simple as that. Regardless of how true, righteous, or hypocritical anybody else lives. you got to get yourself together. And so we have to make sure that we're able to do that. But we're going to stop there. We're going to say that for next week. Keep, put, it, put it on your, put it, it's, it's a good guess. 
put, put it on your uh, on your answer sheet, and then next week before we get started, we'll we'll compare notes. Okay. And, the one who huh? <laughs> 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 Is he gonna go googling? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's going to use Google now. So it looks like uh, Google's our new answer finder, huh? But it does work. I do. What's that? Yes, right. No, it's 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 a, it's a good way of doing it. I mean, you use the resources exactly. But uh, it's important. Any any other comments or questions?